hello and welcome back to the Black Celebration. I am your host, Just Mish, and today we have a very special guest with us, Hank Williams. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, we have weathered the storm in Texas. <laughs> it was one heck of a ride. Um, my heartfelt condolences go out to families that lost um, their family members, those that are dealing with the aftermath of the storm. Um, go vote in 2022 and make sure we get Greg Abbott out of the governor's seat because it's his fault and that's what I believe. Um, anyway, our show tonight, as you know, we always have a black owned sponsor champagne. Tonight it is Corner 103 Sparkling Rosé. Um, and this company is in Napa Valley, California. The owner is Lloyd Davis. Absolutely love him. He is a very, very nice person. FedEx tried to play me, give me the bottles here. And um, Mr. Davis was just really pivotal in making sure that I got everything. So thank you to him. Make sure y'all order from him online. And um, yeah, celebrate being black. Hey, I'm going to let you do the honors of opening and pouring our bottle tonight. It's, um, uh, last time I popped, <laughs> I always get uh, scared because the last time I popped, I wasn't expecting it to move that quickly. All right. So, while you pour, Hank, tell us a little bit about you. So, the great, uh, I do a lot. Yeah. Uh, people from Houston, Prairie View would know me, um, uh, as a DJ and producer. Um, you know, yeah, we uh, need a little bit more in there. <laughs> and then, um, took my talents to the East Coast and mm -hmm. learned so much from the culture out there and, uh, no, we were out there 2014 to 2017, and a lot happened yeah. to black people uh, in that time frame. So all that stuff really affected me. Uh, I always thought about going to law school, and uh, even, you know, I'm up there, you know, going full force with music, mm -hmm. and uh, so it just kind of called me to uh, practice law. So now I'm in law school, a law student in my second year, um, moved back to uh, Dallas, and uh, I'm a producer, DJ, and law future, future attorney. Yes. And you have your own brand. Oh, yes, I have my own brand. Because my shirt tonight, I got this from Hank's line, Miss Chisholm, you know, it's Black History Month, so this is definitely a pioneer black woman um, that I admire, so I think you're wearing one of your... Yep. Biggie and Mike. Yeah. <laughs> called uh, silent statements. Cause I feel like uh, I've always had ideas for shirts. Just never knew how to get them actually put on shirts mm -hmm. without having to go through people. And I found a way and make a huge statement just by wearing it. Right. And not having to always voice your opinion because people don't want to hear it. But they can read it and right. you ain't got to say nothing to them. Yeah. yeah. I need everybody to go check out the line. How can they find the line? So silent statements is uh at silent let's see silent with no e and statements. So yep. silence at silent statements. And we'll have all that information down below. But please check out the line because he has some fire statements when he tells you that um, he's putting statements on shirts so people can read it and not say it. It's some pretty powerful stuff. So go look at it um, again. Thank you for being on the show. Um, we're going to get right into the conversation. So this is the month of Black History. Um, and I wanted to have a conversation, obviously, about Black History, right? But I wanted to bring the conversation more recent than slavery and Jim Crow because we know those things have heavily affected our community, our people, our mental space, and all of those things. Um, but I, I definitely wanted to have a conversation about more recent, and when I say that, I'm talking about, like, the civil rights area up until now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's still a lot to cover when it comes yeah. to black history, uh, because we're obviously still making history. Right. Um, but 
with that, Hank, another reason why I wanted you on the show, I know you are in law school, and so you're studying, you know, history and studying laws and how they affect black people in our community and how you can be a change agent. But there was something that you wrote, um, like, right before the new year. And um, it just, I was like, man, I got to have a conversation with Hank. And we actually were at a New Year's Eve party together, but I was super late, so I actually didn't get there until New Year's Day. It was like 12.30 when I got there or something. So by then, we didn't get to have the conversation. Yeah. But you wrote something on Instagram, and it was called Indifference to the Black Existence. And tell us a little bit about that, because it was very powerful. And so where did that come from? So it was just, I, I had to get off Facebook, like at the end of last summer. Mm -hmm. um, because... I've been going back and forth with people on Facebook and not too much Instagram, just about mm. what's happening with black people, you know, today. And there's just a general in from white people and some who identify as white and who act as though they are white, there's an indifference to our existence. Mm -hmm. Whether it's financial, whether it's through the legal system, whether it's policing us they can just really care less about our existence. Mm. And um, Something you just said, um, people that identify as white. I just found out that I identify as black. I don't know if you remember the newscaster that said um, one of the other personalities, you know, he identifies as black. And I'm like, I identify as black. Like, I am black, fam. Like, right. it, it's not an identity that I'm trying to make people make sure people understand like I'm black yeah. but there literally are people that identify as white and when we say that I'm talking about like other ethnicities so mm -hmm. Hispanic culture you have some of them that identify as white Hispanics yep. Asian same thing white Asians because you have Filipinos that are darker and things like that so yeah to that point I don't identify as black I am black but there are people right. that want to be more connected to whiteness yep. so okay yeah, so uh, it's just it just kind of came out. Uh, I held it for a while. I wrote it last summer. I pitched it to a couple people I know that are attorneys and kind of get their thoughts on it because there's a way. I, I would even have to go back and read it, but it's just for what America has put us through. Mm -hmm knowingly put us through and to still act as if we're burdening them by asking them for rights that they would themselves demand mm -hmm. it, it's crazy to me so yeah. they don't see us as the same just like we, we talk about healthcare these days doctors and nurses are taught that black people have a higher threshold of pain, so they don't treat us the same. There's just a there's just a natural indifference to how they see us and how they perceive us, whether it's on TV, walking down the street, and whether we live or die, whether we, you know, succeed or fail, mm -hmm. um, make it to school, don't make it to school, they just really don't care. Right. And and when they say things like, um, we have a higher threshold of pain, that's obviously not true, right? But you have put us through more pain, and we've had to deal with that. When you, you know, you, talk, you think about um, the people that they used as their own, what is it, what's the word I'm looking for? Their own experiment. Mm -hmm. They experimented on our bodies, putting us through pain, that we didn't have a choice but to go through. Yeah. So to say something like we have a higher threshold, no, you've just forced us to go through pain before. And now you're still teaching students because I've watched nurse, nurses and even doctors um, attest to the fact that that does still happen in like textbook uh, yeah. you know, classroom yeah. conversations. So, yeah, that's why I'm very skeptical of the doctors. Mm -hmm. um, like if, unless there's something really wrong like, I try my best not, to, not to because I don't think they know, I don't think they treat us the same. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily like they treat us bad, but treat us as if if I was a 
25 year old white guy walking in with symptoms of something, they're not going to see me the same as that guy. Mm -hmm. So I'm always like, I, I might as well just go to WebMD and figure it out on my own. Right. Yeah. I definitely feel the same way um, in a lot of spaces when it comes to police. And so we're going to get into all of that. So that was the reason why I really wanted to have this conversation with you because I saw the passion in that post. It was very passionate. You talked about their mental stability and like, well, not their mental stability. You talked about their mental thought process when it comes to our people. And I could just tell that you were pouring out feelings of passion, but it also came from a place of being knowledgeable. So with that, again, this is Black History Month. Shout out to my people. What um, does Black History Month mean to you? Like, what are your thoughts and why is it important? It's important because it was first, I believe, a week. Mm -hmm. um, Carter G. Woodson, um, one of my frat brothers, he um, was able to get Black History Week, which turned into Black History Month, which is always good because, at, I mean, at one point, there was probably no Black History right. in being told, other than parents telling their kids. And I mean, you think about it as of today, if you left up the parents telling their kids, a lot of people don't know. Absolutely. So, to keep the information flowing, I mean, I'm still learning about people. If every Black History Month is somebody else that's brought up from Black History, I'm like, oh my God, how do you know this? Where is this, where is this information been? So, yeah. I feel like it's a great thing. And the whole month you've been putting out content and things on your page and in your story, like giving more information about Black History. So, I've been watching, I, I watched something today about somebody in Minnesota that you mm -hmm. put on your page. So, it's like, I'm constantly, like you said, constantly learning, which that's why I think it's important um, because we don't know a lot, but also because um, nobody else is going to teach us. They're not, in the school system, they have made a point to not teach yeah. blacks in history. You know, like they do not want to allow the pain that they have put us through or the stories where we have been triumphant to be told to the students. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important, but also because, um, like you said, we don't know a lot, and we have to begin to learn these things to tell our kids. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have um, a lot of knowledge when I was younger. You know, I don't. The internet was not as big as it is now, and so a lot of the things that we're able to get the access to. Back when we were growing up, our parents didn't have access to those things. So, my parents actually, I don't know where they got this from, but they had pamphlets, like small books, mm. about people in black history. So my dad would make me sit down and write small, I guess, summaries of what I was reading in these books. So, oh, nice. So, you know, ones that actually stuck out to me growing up were like um, Benjamin Banneker, mm -hmm. um, Bessie Coleman, uh, Charles Drew, uh, I mean, and I'm learning about this, I'm clearly maybe fourth grade, mm -hmm. fifth grade. Yeah. So, Black History was really important to me growing up, and I think the change happened when my parents took me to see Malcolm X. Mm. Uh, so you actually saw that movie in the theaters? Mm -hmm. Wow. It it had a profound effect on me. Um, and my mom was there, she probably tells stories, but in uh, elementary school, I don't remember this for myself, mm -hmm. but it was told to my mom that I stood on, I went to predominantly white school in Fort Worth, mm -hmm. and they said that I stood on the table and was telling kids why we should celebrate Black History Month and okay. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday as a holiday. I don't remember it. The lunch lady said it happened. She told my mom. But that's how that's how much that stuff had an effect on me because I right. understood at a young age that if I'm not learning this in school, that means these white kids are not learning it. So they don't know, they're never going to know. Right. You know, there's people I went to high school with now that, you know, you would tell them, you know, black man created the stoplight. And I probably looked at you like you had two heads. Mm, exactly. So and, and it's sad to me what's sad about saying these things is that 
we wouldn't have to say things like, a black man created the stoplight, if they had just put it in the history books and put pictures to these inventors like they did um, other inventors. Mm -hmm. You know, like the man who created electricity. I saw his picture everywhere, you know? Why did you not include us in these books? We wouldn't have to put so much emphasis on black people creating things if you just included it. Black mm -hmm. history is American history. The things that we have done in this country should be just as equally celebrated and explained to kids at a young age like it is everything else. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about George Washington and like the, the Constitution and how that came about. Like, why don't we talk about these other things and how important they were and include us in these books with pictures so people can see they were black? Well, I think the problem is with with them, the reason they don't want to do that is because once you pull out the real American history, listen, mm. George Washington is not going to be on the pedal. I think it was like the first 19 presidents owned slaves. Yeah. Like, how do you, how do you, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson's brother in law. Yeah, Tom Jefferson's brother-in-law was his own slave. Wow. He had a kid with his a slave. Yeah, he had a kid with the slave's sister. So he was there serving him as he was writing the Declaration of Independence. Wow. So it's like, how do you say that to a class full of integrated kids? Like, hey, the founders of our nation were slaves. They owned your ancestors. And so here's the thing for me, is that they're afraid to say it because it makes them uncomfortable. At this point, I have accepted that slavery happens, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that as, as we grow, we have kids, and we explain that to them, it's something that has to be accepted. Now, do we like it? No, but it did happen. Yeah. So they don't want to say it because it makes them uncomfortable. But if I'm a parent, my child is already going to know this. So you're not going to make my child uncomfortable in classroom, right? Yeah. You're uncomfortable talking about it. White teachers have been predominantly who have been teaching in America. Now, you know, you see way more black teachers. But they were uncomfortable with mm -hmm. the information, and that's why. Yeah. But it's time, to me, it's time for them to be uncomfortable. Like, oh, yeah, it's past time. Yeah, I don't, I don't really feel like I need to walk on eggshells because you're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Or we need to um, decide what we are and aren't going to talk about because it makes people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But to that point, what do you feel like or how do you feel like holistically black people have been affected by our history not being told to us? Um, you have people walking around not knowing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, the, the American history that we know, we people can link back to their heritage. They can figure out how you know where their people were when this stuff in history happened. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and when you don't have a connection to the history, it's kind of pointless loop for you because you don't have a connection to it. Mm -hmm. But if I were to tell you, hey, I can link you back to Claudette Colvin who actually was the first person in Birmingham to not give her seat up mm -hmm. before Rosa Parks. Right. Because she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And, like, you would then have answers. In right. It. So that's the problem. We have people who don't know their own history and can't connect to it, so they don't really care. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, it's history, whatever. But if you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Very true. So with that, how do you feel like the things we've been through have affected us? Like the history, let's talk about civil rights movement. And you just m mentioned um, Santa Nemigan. Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin, who was actually the first person to not give up her seat. Yeah. Um, 
we went through so much. I mean, we could talk about Bloody Sunday, which was the walk on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about Martin Luther King being killed, Malcolm X being assassinated. We can talk, you know, all of that. How do you feel like that has affected the black person and family now? Like, where are we because of those things? Leaderless. Mm. Uh, I mean, they they systematically took out our leaders. The FBI did off the false pretenses of commun you know them uh, bringing communism into American society. Mm -hmm. They put MLK as being a communist, which to my knowledge he wasn't. I feel like the FBI killed him. Fred Hampton. He was a communist. They murdered him. Mm -hmm. Malcolm X. These people were going to bring all people together, not just black people. Right. I don't know if you've seen the new Fred Hampton movie. The I Judas. had a Judas in my side. So, I'm not going to tell you, you know, go deep into the movie, but he was bringing rednecks, Hispanics, and black people together in Chicago as one. You got people with Confederate flags on their jackets walking with Fred Hampton. Wow. How do you fight that? Right. As a as a government, how do you fight me if all people fight together? So Malcolm X is gonna do the same thing. Mm -hmm. He was opening up to white people, he was opening up to other religions to come in and help with the back. Absolutely. So you have to neutralize that. And that's what they did. So now it leaves us with Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, which neither of them have led anything of you know of any since the late 90s, early 90s. So why do you feel like we don't have leaders now? Like why are people um, not able to... Um, Hold on, stop right there. Yeah. Why do you feel like we don't have leaders like Fred Hampton, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King? Um, or even women that are willing to be pioneers like Shirley Chisholm and like so they're there right mm -hmm. but they're all politicians okay and they're all um, driven by money and not the actual mm -hmm. um, mission okay so I believe that Martin Luther King probably would have ran for office later on mm -hmm. you know uh he was still in his 30s, right? Yeah. Like that. yeah. He probably would have ran for office and won. Like, probably in the late 70s. Yeah. Early 80s. He would have won. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm X, maybe. Who knows? We're talking about some of the greatest orders, you know, in, in a century. So, now we have people who try to get means done through a political system that wasn't built for us. Right. We were not in the Constitution. We were not written into the Constitution. They made that plain in Plessy versus Ferguson. They said we were not citizens of the United States. We did not have rights. Wow. Okay, so with that, have they gone and rewritten anything? They did. They, um, after that, they um, passed, I forgot what case that was, but um, they put in an equal um, equal rights clause. Okay. Everybody, and then they had to add about race and stuff, but at first it was just all men are equal. Okay. Right? Then it was, okay, now no one can be discriminated on, you know, based on race or color. Right. So, yeah, they fixed it, but there wasn't any muscle behind it until the 60s. Okay. So, something that has always kind of bothered me with um, American culture and the history of black people is neighborhoods back in the 60s and 70s um, being predominantly black but flourishing mm -hmm. and the fact that now we don't necessarily have that we still have black neighborhoods yeah. but they're not flourishing like they used to what are your thoughts on that like how do we get to that place so Something I've said in my head, but I've never said it out loud. But I think we had black flight. You know how you had white flight mm -hmm. where they left the city and went out to the suburbs? Mm -hmm. We had black flight. 
you you have the generation that benefited from affirmative action. Mm -hmm. My parents, age group. Right. Um, so you have a whole, probably from the 80s to 2000, you have a whole generation of the workforce who was able to benefit, um, rightly so, Yeah. from affirmative action and becoming, you know, VPs and high executive officers. And, okay, what do you then, you get up that, to that point, what do you want next? Your kids have a great education. Right. You gonna stay in a failing inner city school district, or are you gonna go out to the A plus plus school district in the in the in the suburbs? So this is the thing. How did our neighborhoods turn into the failing inner city school district? They um, money. I funding. know. Yeah, funding. Yeah. yeah. So you have the taxes like in a Cypress mm -hmm. in Houston. Those. School property taxes are expensive. Right. And you have, like, where I live, in South Oak Cliff, it's an aging demographic. So they their property taxes are being taken differently because they're older, they don't have kids in school. Mm -hmm. So DISD, it, first of all, DISD is too big. Second, yeah. second, they don't have enough money to put into every school. And that is the thing. So, I have a history of um, Dallas, a history in Dallas ISD. And um, now my little brother is a student in Dallas ISD. So, I have become heavily interested in making change and being a part of like the voice for the community. I started going to, before COVID, um, the meetings monthly mm -hmm. for the board um now the meetings are on zoom so you can still i still have you know signed into some of them but definitely being an advocate for our communities because they have taken the money away from our areas but like in north dallas i'm in the north dallas area now these schools in this area don't have the same issues that they have in Oak Cliff or South Dallas. Yeah. And it's because they're given the funding, but it's also because these parents use their voices to advocate for that. And so I know it's a different tax bracket here in the North than it is the South, but these parents also don't put up with a lot from the districts. So they put more money into it. But what I've seen just historically is that Black people, we had our own, you know, areas like stores and, you know, I'm talking about grocery stores and, you know, everything to keep our areas. And I'm not saying that we need to be completely separate, but I would like to see our areas flourish like that again. So, I'm in the opinion that, and just take it back a little bit, MLK, if he, hindsight being 2020, if he saw what happened. Mm -hmm. when we were given equal rights, he probably would have done what Marcus Garvey and people like him were saying to do is give us our own, leave us alone, and we'll flourish. And we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Yeah. MLK and people like him were trying so hard to have us fit into a society that never wanted us. Right. So now you have people going for the American dream leaving their communities behind. I mean, in essence, the white community is everywhere. Our communities were, were abandoned. Yeah, so, I mean, we have people that knew all along that we would probably never be fully accepted in a short time frame into, you know, white society. Right. Um, it was funny is we almost as a people even during slavery we were almost sent away by the government mm -hmm. so during the civil war Abraham Lincoln had a meeting with Frederick Douglass and other uh, slave abolitionists his original plan was to round up all the black people 
put them on a boat, and send them to Costa Rica. Just take them out of America all together because first, we weren't wanted. Second, we were the cause of all the strife. And Frederick Douglass basically said, no, we're not the problem. Sla slavery's the problem. Right. It's not for us to figure out to fix y'all's evil deeds, right? Correct. And then, you know, stuff happened and Emma, you know, okay, uh, Frederick Douglass and Lincoln kind of got on the same page where we need full citizenship mm -hmm. and full rights, equal rights, and we were heading in that direction and Lincoln got assassinated, all that, all that, you know, went away. So there's a, I mean, there's a, a it, it keeps happening. There's a trend, mm -hmm. if you think about it. Black people were just going to get an inch after be, just being slaves. Well, what happened? Jim Crow. White violence. Right. Black people get a little bit of it. We can go to white schools. What happens? White violence. White violence. Okay, I get what you're saying. Okay. White violence. Yeah. You do anything to piss off white people or get a give a an inch to anybody outside of who they think deserves those rights. Violence. Who, 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 the, the Klan. The Klan was born from Reconstruction. They were given black black people had protection from union from the government because from violence. The Supreme Court said that's not constitutional. Uh, the state isn't doing violence. It's people, individuals. So we can't tell individuals not to be violent. And since you're not citizens, you don't have a right to bring a lawsuit. Mm. That's where the Klan came from. The Klan started terrorizing black people. Once we get an inch, white violence. That's very true because that happened, you know, we were just talking about the South Dallas neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there is a, and I'll leave the link for people to watch this link, but I feel like this happened to neighborhoods all over the U.S., but it was a flourishing black neighborhood. They had a, their own grocery stores, attorneys in the areas, insurance companies, all of that in South Dallas. And South Dallas for the city of Dallas is where MLK and Malcolm X Boulevard, you know, connect. Near, near Fair Park. Right. And it was white violence. They, they started coming over into the neighborhood. Now, you already left. Yeah. You're already in North Dallas. You didn't already moved all the way up 35 and left, and you're in a downtown area. Why are you coming back over here? But they started coming back out there and burning the houses. Yeah, same thing with um, Tulsa. Right. We have our own thing. Yeah. And they massacred a whole town. So it's, it's, I mean, now at this point, we would have our own people to defend ourselves. Right. Right. Um, but our collective talents are so spread out into America, the people who would lead our next revolution are working in some cubicle. Very true. They're working in some cubicle trying to be the next CEO of whatever company that they work for. Mm -hmm. But you got people who... So maybe the the fight is lost? I don't, it's not lost because you have people like, what's her name? Um, the lady from New York that uh, her name starts with a T. Um, Tamika? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got people like her, you got Lee, Mary, you got, I mean, you have people out here, but again, politicians and attorneys, but they're making a difference. Yeah. Um, I just think the only way we're going to get where we need to be as far as rights and police violence, stuff like that, I think there's going to have to, because the evidence is there. I mean, there's enough video out there to show what's happening. Right. It is going to have to be a all out, everybody on one accord, voting people in and out of office based on the black agenda. Right. And people want, okay, we got to get rid of Trump, we got to get rid of Trump. But, damn, okay. 
Now what? Now we got Biden. Are we going to get what we're looking for? Who? It's still to be seen. But then I was have arguments, arguments with my dad. If you get Trump out, then you hold Biden accountable. And then what? Next. Okay, get Biden out. Hold the next person accountable. It's a cycle. Right. It keeps happening. I mean, politics itself, I mean, to me, I feel like we need to be fighting locally Mm -hmm. before we can get to that national level of making sure that we're holding people accountable because Michelle cannot hold Joseph Robinette, his middle name is Robinette, and I'm going to call him Robinette, so he's out of office. I can't hold him accountable just myself. I need my senator and I need my governor to do that. And that's where I feel like I'm still so mad at these people in Texas for not voting for Senator Royce West and allowing that MJ or MK lady, whatever her name is, to be him. But those are the elections that we really need to be voting in. I think that a lot of times we get lost in the presidential election. And it's like, like you said, oh, get, get Trump out, get Trump out. Yeah, but who else do you have in for you? Who's the person that just allowed Texas to be powerless? It, it's sad that Royce didn't even really get a fair shot. Um, he didn't. I, I think the funding probably wasn't there. But just looking at his track record by itself, what he's done for Texas, Dallas. Dallas. Yeah. I mean, there's no question he should be a U.S. senator. No question. But I think he may have waited too long. Yeah. I think he waited too long. I mean, he got comfortable in Texas and waited too long because, I, I mean, at a certain point, people probably don't even know who he is. Yeah. Maybe 10, 15 years ago. Well, M- MJ, she's known for riding bikes. That's why everybody <laughs> knows who she is. But yeah. either way, I think that, yes, it's definitely important to vote in the presidential election um, when I saw the movie um, Selma, mm-hmm. I actually took my dad to see that movie, and um, my dad teared up, you know, watching the movie because he just he started to remember what it was like being a young boy watching that happen on mm-hmm. TV. That's something that he saw, and he was just like to to watch this again. Um, you know, reenactment of it just brought back so many feelings because he had to go to school the next day. Yeah. And that's a lot of what happens with us now. We yeah. see all these shootings, we see all of these um, unjust things happen to our people, and then we have to move the next day like n- we never yeah. saw it. So I'm pretty sure we all have a form of PTSD. Oh, absolutely. There's no way because it'll be like the smallest semblance of what's been happening for these past 10 years Mm -hmm. and I just get like like after Ahmaud Arbery like it first hit me back when Philando Castile and um but when Philando Castile died or got murdered by the police and then the other guy in Baton Rouge Mm -hmm. when those two happened back to back like nothing like that had ever affected me like emotionally the way that did right um and then as it continued it, it got worse um like brown taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and you know and george floyd and all the all the rest of them it's just now it is visceral like it it affects me when, yeah. it, when it happens and especially when we see the videos you know, um, I'll tell you, when this first started, things like this first started affecting me was Trayvon Martin. I think that for our generation, that was the first time we'd actually seen in real time something like that happen and it be such national news mm-hmm. and see the injustice of that man getting off from killing that young boy. And I just remember being so upset. Um, I called my mom and I just, I just, I couldn't understand. I was like, how did this happen? And, you know, she was just trying to talk to me about it. But that's when I started to really understand that um, this isn't going to stop here. Because right when, 
right around the time when they were in trial, something happened with another young man in Florida around the same age as Trayvon Martin. Um, he was in Florida as well, and his mom ended up running for office, and now she's uh, in office in her area. But I'm just saying that, like, I realized then this isn't going to stop. Like, they're going to keep doing this to us. Well, it's been happening. Yeah. It's just not being caught on camera. Right. It's so clear. And it ha- all of it is not national news. Yeah. You know, all of it doesn't make the CNN, and all of it doesn't make... Um, make it to our phones and things like that so yeah this stuff has been i mean what happened with trayvon what happened with mike brown what happened with i mean all of them this stuff has been happening for decades it's just now able to be captured so quickly on people's phone i mean if you think about technology in the past 15 years the camera quality alone yeah is way better than anybody probably ever would have thought so being able to take a 4k video high definition of somebody with their knee on somebody's neck for eight minutes yeah that could wasn't possible in the 90s right so it's stuff has been happening so it's just coming to a head now and i just like dave Chappelle said (laughs) some better pop some better Change quick because he was like, hey, after this, it's chitty chitty bang bang. Black people don't have anywhere else to go. Right. And honestly, black people are at their wit's end yeah. with how much we can take. Yeah, we don't have anywhere else to go but to the streets. Yeah. Like, and people have, I'm talking about mild manner people are fed up. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's exhausting to say the least. Um, but it's taxing on our mental health. It's taxing on um, our ability to move past some of it because I'm still stuck on my friend, Sandy. You know, mm-hmm. um, I still cannot fathom the fact that that happened to my friend. And I can just imagine that it is the same thing for all these other families. Like, you just can't get past something like that, and especially when it keeps happening. Yes. But with that, you mentioned earlier leaders, and I think that, so Tamika, I believe her last name is Mallory. Yeah. Um, and then we have Lee Merritt, who's here in Dallas, right? He, stay, he lives in Dallas. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have other leaders, but who are some of the historical leaders from like the civil rights era or past, you know, most recent that you have connected with or that have impacted your life in some way in your thought process i think malcolm x is probably who i connect with the most um just because he was first and foremost for the advancement the health mental health education for black people, mm-hmm. um, for women to, you know, be raised in a way and, and taught in a way to where be your own person, but you know, this is how you present yourself in public, mm-hmm. you know, and um, then to the existential threat. Shoot them back. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand what the what the question is. Like, right. you shoot me, you shoot my friend for being black, just based off race alone. I shoot you. Like, what is the question? Like, I feel like nonviolence has its place, but you can't fight violence. I mean, you. Yeah, you know, you can't you can't fight violence with a smile. Right. And I, I just feel like I felt that more than the nonviolent movement just because it's like that I have one of my shirts. Y'all shot him okay too? Exactly. He did because of violence. Mm-hmm. So Malcolm X is really somebody that I have connected with. And it's simply because in watching clips of Malcolm X and reading different things about him, 
it's like you said, he was just, to me, holistically focused on black people being excellent. Mm -hmm. That's all he wanted from us, was just like for us to be educated, whatever that looks like, because I know a lot of people are like, oh, well, everybody can't go to college, and every, you know, college is not for everybody. Okay, but there are still ways to educate yeah, yourself. They, outside were, they of, were training people. Exactly. So, so, so that gives you like the Nation of Islam, which I know everybody, you don't have to be Muslim to understand what the Nation of, Muslim, the Nation of Islam was about, but that's why so many black people in the 60s and the 70s and probably up until today are Muslim. Mm -hmm. Grew up Baptist, became an adult, and are now Muslim because they found a religion, a part of a religion that focused on the mind, body, and soul and the furtherance of black people, period. Right. Southern black people, southern black churches, money, scandal. Uh, I mean, yeah, right. You know, MLK had his own little issue. A I, lot of never met him. He didn't have that. Right. So it's it's like if you're looking at an example of where a black society could be. Let's just say you don't. Let's say you don't have to be Muslim, but you follow the. You know, the training, the education, the uh, vocational stuff of the Nation of Islam. Our people will be educated on ourselves, educated on the world, educated on how to maybe a trade mm -hmm. that they learn, even if they didn't go to college. Right. I just feel like we would have been way better off if we were able to sustain ourselves. We have some of the smartest people that have ever been on this planet. Have been, Absolutely. have been black. Yeah. So smartest, most talented. So to tell me that we couldn't have sustained on our own, I feel like it's just a, it's just a lie. Yeah. Who else? Who else have you have been paying to? Um. Probably. And again, I'm on the radical side, mm -hmm. so. People like Huey P. Newton and you okay. know people like that just not just sitting back taking it, yeah. like they fight back for us. Um, and oh, Colin Kaepernick, I I just don't feel like he gets his just due solely because it's new. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to my uncle and I said, y'all, Colin Kaepernick is this generation's Muhammad Ali. They're like, oh no no no, Muhammad Ali did this, and I said. The only difference is that Muhammad Ali's case was for freedom of religion and it went to the Supreme Court. Colin Kaepernick sacrifices NFL career for people he would never meet and fought one of the biggest businesses mm -hmm. in the world on behalf of the plight of black people. So... Colin Kaepernick, it, to me, I see the same, kind of like the same parallel with Colin Kaepernick and Malcolm, I mean, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali is one of my favorite athletes, um, but it's not because of just how athletic he was. I love that he was for the people. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, that was about religion. He was able to fight that because of religion. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, in essence, it did have a lot to do with what he said, like, I'm black. Why would I go fight for this country um, when y'all y'all don't give me what I need while I'm here? Yeah. But I do see the parallel between Colin and um, Muhammad Ali. But I was going to mention that I think the only thing for me and Colin is that I have not heard him speak a lot. And he doesn't have to. His actions. If does you look, he not? If you, if you look at his page, if you look at what he does, mm -hmm. he goes and is in the streets helping people. Okay. He's not about making speeches. His actions speak. speak. Okay. And he did what he did to start the conversation and it happened. Right. They, look at the NFL now. I don't even watch football. Well, would you? So on? they have, you know, people, you know, Brown Taylor names on the back of the oh, helmet, okay. but all this is NFL 
sponsor stuff. So the NFL is actually doing what Connor Kaepernick was trying to do then. Okay. Like the NBA did. Mm-hmm. So it took how many years, how many lawsuits, how much money, how much strife for the NFL to learn, oh my God, we were wrong. Yeah. When all they had to do is listen to somebody who did a nonviolent protest, a silent protest, and the, would answer a question when the um, media would ask them one. Mm-hmm. And with blackball, if that isn't on the same level as Muhammad Ali, I don't know what is. Right. Okay. And it's act, Muhammad Ali was just loud, period. Yeah. Colin Kaepernick isn't. And his actions, like you really actually do a small dive into what he's done since him not being in the NFL. Mm-hmm. He's won so many awards for his um, work in the community. Okay. So, this is something that I'm not very familiar with because I don't, NFL is not my thing, football is not my thing. Now, you, you want to talk about LeBron James, I can tell you, you know, all of what he's doing because I'm very much into NBA, but then I'm also. A, a huge fan of LeBron James and his efforts outside of the game. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, thank you for that knowledge. And that that's why you're here. So what do you feel like, this is our last question, what do you feel like we can do as a people to combat the history that we've experienced, you know? And that's a lot. That's a loaded question because there's a lot of things that we can do. But what are some things that you would say um, we could do as a people to move forward and be cognizant of our history, continue to teach our kids about the black pioneers that we have had, but then also to push forward our culture. I think it's happening. It's just we're so spread out now Mm -hmm. that we connect through social media and are educating the masses through what we post. So I think it's important for people to vet what they post Mm -hmm. and um, don't get caught up in battling people on social media. Mm -hmm. Just give people the information and let them figure it out on their own Mm -hmm. Um, as far as the education side of it. And, you know, teach kids and uh, teach other, you know, other people's kids if you have that opportunity. And, and watch some of these movies that have been out that show like Rosewood. Like if you want to show the ugliness of America and to show, you know, how, where we come from, mm-hmm. movies like Rosewood and, and Roots and stuff like that and just move it on up and go to the American, African American Museum in the Smithsonian in D.C. Mm-hmm. I've been three times. And that place, it, it's a, you haven't been is made to symbolize the rise of black people in America. Mm. You start at the bottom and you go up Mm. and the bottom starts with, you know, the slave trade and you feel like you're in a slave ship when you're down there and you go into, you know, cotton and slavery and then it goes to um, abolitionists and you get uh, Harriet Tubman shawl in there, her Bible and Frederick Douglass stuff. I mean, you got real history in there. Then you get to Jim Crow, segregation, and then you get to the Black Power Movement, mm-hmm. and it starts getting colorful, music, and then you get to the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the Soul Train, and you get to um, then the Barack Obama, you know, the Obama stuff, it's kind of like, man, we kind of made, okay, then you go further, and you get to the music, and mm-hmm. it's just, you have to go out and actually look for the information, it's there. Right. And I'm sure there's more stuff now than when I went. Because I went the first day that I've been a couple times after. Um, but to move forward, I just think we need a a leader to bring us all together. Because when you have black young black people out there trolling for Trump, something went wrong somewhere yeah. That's and absolutely something absolutely. went wrong somewhere and I don't and you can believe what they want politically but when it comes to good and evil right and wrong and you are really believing this stuff 
Right. I mean, if anybody was going to believe that stuff, because where I grew up, how I grew up, it would have been me. Mm-hmm. Because I was around these type of people all the time. But my parents are still there something me early to where I'm growing up knowing who I am, where I come from. Right. If you don't know that, you cling on to whatever you think is going to, you're going to survive. Right. So we, we need leadership. I just don't know where it's going to come from. Well, you know, I, I agree with you. I think a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago, I kind of asked the question, why don't we have leaders like we did um, during civil rights? Because even, I mean, we say names like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King because those were like the people really in the forefront. But you have people like Jose Williams that were in Atlanta fighting right next to, you, you know, with him. Um, John, he just passed away. Um, why can't I think of his name? Um, but we also had people that were walking right next to mm-hmm. Martin Luther King. And when he died, they continued to fight for us. So it takes... So you have to be able to talk to right. people and make people believe what you're saying in your speeches and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I think we haven't had that person with the drive, the motivation, and the charisma to mm-hmm. make people listen. Right. Um, Tamika, she's great. She, she's great. She's great. And she's there to me. Yeah. But we're not under one so I know this last question but we don't all see the plight the same way either very true so you have people looking at her as troublemaker why you out here making all this trouble I'm living good I don't have any issues with Mm. police so why do I have to fit underneath your narrative see back in the 60s 70s all black people were under the same threat it's not, it's not the same here. You have money, you're not under that same threat unless you step by line. Right. So. And that's the part that I don't understand how people don't see. I think that just as I'm a two time HBC graduate, right? So I obviously in school learned to have this love and passion for my people. Um, That's where it came from for me. As a child, my parents obviously were very proud to be black, but that wasn't something that we talked about all the time in home. That came from me being a student at Prairie View and then going on to live in a city like Atlanta where, I mean, black people are, it's the mecca for black people, right? Um, So with that, that's where my passion came from. But I could have very well been, I grew up in North Irving, my mom then moved us to Louisville. I could have very well just been fine and comfortable staying in those areas. But to the point of the question that I asked you as far as like what we, what can be done, that's one thing for me that I'm very, very, very serious about and in bringing money back into the black community. Mm-hmm. And my goal is to teach people and help people understand that living in South Dallas, living in Oak Cliff is not a bad thing. Um, if we bring money back to the area, we can see the area grow. Mm-hmm. Um, you do have real estate agents right now, black real estate agents that are trying to bring young people like us back into those neighborhoods so that, you know, the tax bracket can grow. And uh, that's something that I'm, I'm very serious about talking to people um, about because I think it's important for us to come back to our area. But that came from probably being a student at PV. Yeah. Not I, growing up in Louisville. I think the issue you're going to run into with that is people who grew up in that area that you're trying to bring people back to is that black flight. Exactly. It's real. That's and what it's I'm saying. Still, it's, I'm saying you got people who will run to Red Oak and Oh, yeah. in Louisville before they would ever go to South Dallas. Go to South Dallas. Yeah. Here. So and then you want me to come visit you? I'm not driving to Red Oak. I'm, that's absolutely out. So I think that's I think that's a problem. We have to bring the importance and the value back to 
our neighborhoods and it and they're trying because I live like I said I live in South Oak Cliff I live right around the corner from what's that part uh Glendale. Glendale. I live right around from Glendale. I live there, and they are trying, um, for sure. They're trying, but what we can't do because this is to that point is that people who move to um, Villa, what is it called, Villa? Oh, Villa, or they'll move to McKinney, or they'll move to you know Red Oak, but they complain about gentrification. So don't complain when. Fair Park changes, that area changes, and you're not included in the change because you decided to move further out the city and not be in the neighborhoods where they're going to come back to because it's happening. Fair, Fair Park, right now, there is development happening in that area. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Oak Cliff. Bishop Arts is this new neighborhood in Oak Cliff, but that is Oak Cliff. That is predominantly being a black neighborhood. Yeah, South Dallas is too close to develop for that not to be... A hot spot. Yeah. yeah. And so that's my thing is, y'all, it's going to happen. Either you're going to get on the boat. <laughs> that is a horrible uh, analogy. But either you're going to get with it or you're not. And they're going to come in these neighborhoods and they are going to change it around. And then you're going to be upset and you're going to start talking about gentrification. But instead of you getting on board with everybody else and moving into the neighborhood, you want to go to Louisville or Plano. Yeah. So... Yeah. Anyway, um, I agree with you on so many things. You made some very good points. Um, you brought a lot of histories and things that I didn't know. Um, I appreciate you. I think I need uh, a history lesson just on, you know, the Constitution and all of those things. Cause I didn't even realize we weren't citizens. So um, I appreciate you again coming to the show. Um, how can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the, uh, my own page, KNG Henry IV, King Henry IV, and um, the shirts, solid statements with no E. Absolutely. You can find Hank around the city um, DJing, making sure that he's getting these statements out to people, <laughs> and then also, like you said, in law school because he is a future attorney that's going to help be a change agent for our community. Again, Hank, thank you. Thank you to Corner 103 yes. for our sparkling yeah. rosé. Yeah, it's really, really good. Um, I appreciate you all listening, watching. Please be sure to follow us um, on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram at JustMish underscore. All of our information will be in the description. Thank you for coming out. All right, so we have reached uh, a very important part of the show, our... Piece of pop culture. Yes, with my main man, Justice Tyreek. And um, I'm excited about this, but first, we're going to talk about our wine tonight. Our sparkling rosé. We had a rosé last time. We did, yeah. Yeah, yeah so we're, we're going to have to compare the two now. Um, let me take a sip. Switch it around. Let me smell it. Do you switch it around? I don't think so. I think it. <laughs> That's the So, I want to say that I absolutely love this brand. Um, it tastes amazing, yes. but I'm just going to talk about Mr. Lloyd Davis for a second and tell y'all that that is one of the sweetest persons I have ever talked to over the phone in my entire life. Like, he just made me feel like, you know, everything was going to be okay. And that he was gonna make sure that he took care of it. And he did, he literally did everything he could on oh. his end. Um, again, FedEx is trash. So, um, yeah, I just really wanna say to Mr. Davis, thank you so much. Thank you for um, your amazing customer service. Thank you for being a black man that has created his own wines, that has created his own tasting room. Um, matter of fact, from their Instagram, Corner103, you guys can follow them. He says that he's the first black-owned winery to be named the number one tasting room in the United States. Yes, sir. And I just think that is simply amazing. And let me tell you why he is named that from my own 
opinion. Because this one is everything. It's quite good. It's, I mean, so, this is the thing. I can actually taste flavor of grapes with this. Um, and I'm not the biggest connoisseur as far as being able to describe. However, I know that I'm tasting a grape. It doesn't just taste like light or airy or bubbly. Like, I'm actually tasting um, flavor. Which and you don't get a lot. You don't. Especially with a sparkling. Like, champagnes are not the most tasty. Um, no, it's, it's an yeah. acquired taste. It is very much an acquired taste. And so, he gives a lot of um, flavor in his wine. And it says that he crafted it from a Pinot Noir, a Chardonnay, um, and it's a French style wine. He just did a really good um, job with the taste of the wine. And so, I can see why he's been named number one because I can honestly pair this with a good shrimp pasta mm. um and i know that because of the grape that they have in it i would then feel i would be able to get more flavor in the food no, that makes sense, yeah. yeah so i mean he did a very nice job it's great sir <laughs> um another thing about it is i like this on the packaging the goldish rolls right here yeah. that he has i think that's really really nice because that's one of my favorite colors. Like I'm really into blush and all of that. So it looks it looks nice. It looks well done, expensive. We love that. Quality. Quality. It's definitely yeah. quality. Um he is about in the thirty dollar range per bottle. Um thirty to forty, I think it was like thirty five dollars a bottle, which isn't bad. No, yeah. For um a champagne. It's not bad for a brand that also is not distributed in other stores. So, like, we can't go pick him up at any store. Like, the last one, you have to order directly from him. He's in Napa. Uh, I believe it says Sonoma County. I don't know anything about California County. <laughs> so, that must be where Napa is. I but think it is. I think so. I'm he, not yeah. Well versed. <laughs> <laughs> he has a, um, an actual tasting um location that you can go to so when you guys are going to napa and you're doing your tours make sure that you guys stop into corner 103. we definitely will it is quite tasty sir i am enjoying it i definitely need me a couple sips for this black history month yes black history month let me tell you something else that this is not it's not too bubbly it's not you know how Ooh. sometimes um Champagnes or sparklings can give you that very like airy feeling in your chest after like you drink it. Because... Right? <laughs> yes. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. <laughs> that I don't I don't have that with this. No, it's it's, it's I'm enjoying this. This is quite great. And I, yeah. I really love it, honestly. And I I'm so glad that he was so nice and everything. So sweet. So nice. So and sweet. he looks like such a good person. Y'all go support. Yes. We Follow them on Instagram, there. corner one oh three. One zero three. One zero three. Well, we love to see it. Yes. Are we ready for the piece of pop culture? Yes, honey. I'm. I'm. Listen. I'm gonna pour some more. Uh, you know what? Sip. Give me just a little bit too. While you give it, absolutely. So I wanted to start with. You know, we have to say, our rest in peace, to Madam. Yes. Miss Cicely Tyson. Unfortunately, we lost her we recently. Great. Uh, and I can say that I was I was quite surprised. I was a little devastated. Mm -hmm. I saw it. Uh, unfortunately, I found out on you know my news station, which is Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, you know what, Lord, I just need to log off. Like I just I put my phone down, put it back on Do Not Disturb because it's always on Do Not Disturb. And then I just had to go, you know, have a minute with Jesus in the shower because why? Why would you take her away? I don't. It's but she was what ninety. Four? I don't remember. Was she? Was it ninety four? She was. She was. Up, she was up there. But yeah. I wanted. I just wanted her to be here. I did. Time. I wanted her to be here, and I was very much affected by it. Um, I screamed when I saw it. Um, I didn't want to believe it. Right. I fully went through all the stages of grief. I was mad about it. Was a little depressed for a second, like, wow, we just lost a pioneer in the, you know, Hollywood scene for black women. 
And um, yeah, so rest in peace, sister. You have earned the peace that you are going to enjoy um, in the upper room Ooh. because we know she is now watching over us. But such a beautiful woman, beautiful spirit, and Definitely. you all miss her. Definitely. So prayers for their family. You know, we can never be prepared, even though at, at a large age, you just never, you just never ready for it. You're not. It's, it's just super sad. I was just not here for it, but, you know, she gave us a lot, and she's a legend. She's an icon, and she'll yes. be forever missed. Um, now, somebody is coming back. I don't know if you heard. Somebody's coming out. He's coming out of prison. Is it prison? He been in prison, Bobby Schmerz? Yeah, he's he has absolutely been in prison. So the streets have been wanting him to come back since he went in, and I don't understand because he only has one song, I think. Literally one song. Yeah, I feel like it's only pop- like didn't wasn't the song popular when Vine was a thing? You know, I never got into Vine. So you didn't get into Vine, girl. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, do it for the Vine. I ain't gonna do it. I like Vine. <laughs> I, I enjoyed Vine. Vine was a moment. I heard that Vine was like one of the best moments though. Like it was really, really funny. I don't know how people were so funny with them six seconds. That's it. That's like, all you have got. to have comedic timing to be able to be funny in six minutes or six seconds. Right. Like I don't even, because now they give you what, how long you get? You get a minute on Instagram. Mm-hmm. It's too long. Like y'all, y'all ain't funny. We don't like it. Let's go back to Vine. Like that was good. I enjoyed that because that was funny. You get you get your laughs. You get the news. But Vine was annoying. But no, he's so apparently he's coming back soon. Um, he should be out by now. So here's the thing: the streets literally kept this man relevant of one song for like six or seven years. It was the hat throw. It was the hat throw. It was. It, it has just been. The, yeah, it had been a little. little and a little bite. Yeah. <laughs> I still do it. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'll do it. It's, it's full. It was fully a cute little bit, I, and I was here for it. So well, yeah. he's gonna he's gonna have some money when he comes out. I, I assume. I don't know. I heard Quavo said that he wanted to pick him up from the prison. From well, the somebody prison. needs to take care of him because the only reason why that man was still in prison because he didn't snitch. So, well, take care of him. That's that's a blessing. <laughs> I'm saying because he could have just opened his mouth. That's what six nine did. Oh, did you see that him and Meek Mill? Oh God! I don't even now that I ignored because that little boy be saying the N word and Daniel Hernandez. And his, Daniel Hernandez. You don't get to say the N word, child. And his 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 hair is just I don't understand. He's a whole man. I don't yeah. like it. His hair looks like a tropical bag of Skittles, and I'm just oh. I just don't. He looks like he doesn't take baths regularly. He can't. Then you just can't. I don't understand. Maybe all those cartoonish tattoos would come off. They can't be real. I just, what is he going to do with his life? Like, I don't, why, I don't, I mean, he's lucky that he's still alive. I'm not yeah. lie to you. Because I don't understand. Because the streets don't like him. And he keeps beefing people. The streets don't like him. And Meek looks like an absolute clown arguing with him. Stop arguing with him. Why? Like, why? Why? what are they arguing about? I don't understand. They're just, they're goofies. They are goofy. And I just, I can't do it. I cannot. It's too. It's too much. I, they were arguing. Was it about? I don't even remember what it was about. Honestly, was it about Nikki? No, it couldn't have been about Nikki. It could have been probably just some goofy stuff. Yeah. Child, it's a mess, honey. It these the streets are going through it apparently these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to see a black man get out of prison. I, I hope that he's able to do all that he can to stay out of you know. Yeah, see, hopefully he does stay out. We, I want him to, you know, do well. Give us some more music. Give us some bops. Maybe he can do a song with Megan, you know, because I would Real like cute. to hear. I would like to hear that because my girl, you know, is is still grinding, still working. I see she's still in the studio she making is. bops. We love to see it, and she also got a man now. Does she? Do you, yes. It's, his name is Party, but like Cardi, but with a P. His okay. name is Partisan Fontaine. Is who it is. He had a song with Cardi B back in the day. Back, backing it up, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it was a cute little moment. That was a good verse that she did. Now they say. Yeah. They say that he wrote it. They say that that's her ghostwriter. Um, well, he does a good job. He does a good job. Although I cannot understand a lot of the stuff that Cardi B says. 
once the song has been played a few times, then I start to understand her. So if he's writing for her, he does a good job. I don't, you know, they say he does that, but then these kids, you just never know. I think it's okay. It's okay if somebody writes for you. Okay. Yeah, why not? And she's always said that she's in it for the money. Yeah. Uh, not the artistry. Because hey, if I can if I can go do a little one two in the studio, I would absolutely do it. And be worth twenty that she's worth twenty four million dollars. She's only been out for four years. And Paul Adela was I mean a uh, moment, but twenty four million dollars? Out here with with uh Lamborghinis and stuff, honey. No. She's for sure an entertainer. I I hope the same for Meg. I know. Because the thing about Meg is that she does write yes. her. So I hope that her and Party don't have no situation like Nikki and what's what's your name? Safari. Hope that it doesn't turn into that where Party is writing all her wrongs. Safari, I forgot about him. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. He was writing a lot of Nikki's wrongs. Oh yeah. So I that hope maybe Party fun. just, you know inserts himself every now and then but I like the way Meg writes. I like her rhymes. She's she's Texas for real. Yeah she's, she is. She's H down down and we love to see it obviously. I love to see her win and I hope that she just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Yeah. I don't want her to stop honestly. I hope that her being in a relationship doesn't change her like momentum with music. Yeah I mean because how is she going to tell us to you know, take these men's money <laughs> and things if she got a man. Like, I don't understand. I don't know how that's going to work, but I feel like she's, you know, she prays to Bundy, so I assume that that will be fine. I think she'll she'll still be able to give us a little bop or two. Uh, now, what I'm waiting on is Kanye's new album. Because... Kanye ha- I, You know, I stopped listening to Kanye. You know me too? When but, he said slavery was a choice, I was like, you're absolutely out. Okay, but now that he's leaving he these Kardashians, we might get Kanye back. This is true. I don't know if we're going to get Kanye back. I doubt it. Well, okay, so let's talk about it. Maybe being with the Kardashians was causing him to be a little bit more mentally unstable. I mean, so maybe we will get him back. Because that's a lot of pressure. That's a that's a famous family. And Very much so. Everything that they do is so contrived and just yeah. calculated. And I don't know. Uh, they, they've been together so long. I didn't even... I forgot. How many... They got like four or five kids. All named after like cars and planes <laughs> or something. <laughs> you know, uh, they... I don't know. I wonder who's going to get the majority of the, the house. Because that's a big old house they got. I just... That's true. Uh, maybe they'll just, like, sell the house I don't know. I wonder how the closet's going to be split, because they be wearing the same clothes they look like. Relax! I don't... I just, <laughs> I'm just wondering. Like, I just have so many thoughts going through my head, because if we can get... What was the first album? College Dropout? Mm-hmm. Oh, if we could get one of those now, I wasn't even in middle school. <laughs> I don't care. I don't have a lot to you. But it's a good album. It was a good album. Ooh, yeah. It just made me feel real young. You oh. are. And it's totally okay. That hurt my heart. <laughs> you really... are very young. I mean, College Dropout came out probably when I was a senior in high school. In high school. Yeah. Ooh, um, so was that, what was that? We're not going to tell not, the okay. people. We're not going to tell the people. Uh, um, but, I mean, they they obviously could go Google. They don't know what you're to say. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if he could give us some wrongs like that, if he could give us that type of... Um, connection because I'm just not connected to him anymore. Like, no, and you said some wild, wild things. I mean, some people say some funny, some off the wall stuff, and I can let him come back, but I don't know. I don't know. It's just he's giving me so many good things, but the bad. Do you like his fashion? Are you into his like shoes and the clothes? Some and- of them, yes. Some of them. I am. Other things, no. I don't understand them. They look like they were put into like, you know, a blender and then you just spit out a shoe or a slide. Them slides are ugly. That looks like something you wear on the moon. I don't understand those slides. I don't get it. I know so many people that have them and they just look like a loaf of bread that you just cut. You know, they look like a a boat, like a, a bread boat. And I just, why would you put that on your feet? Yeah. I don't like that. 
I don't like that. I don't like that at all. <laughs> mm-mm. Mm-mm, nah, not I'm not into his family. I'm really just not into him as a person anymore. So hopefully, you know, they both get clarity in that divorce and they can move forward and can get back to being a better person. They both rich, so they'll be fine. I'm sure there's not a prenup. I'm sure Chris Jenner is gonna do something. I, she's oh, coming out with a makeup line. I heard she just patented for her own makeup line, maybe for the old ladies. I don't know. She's not gonna compete with Rihanna though. Oh, really? I can tell you that. Cause the Fenty Beauty baby now worth what? What a billion? A billion. A, how a billion dollars? Let me tell y'all something. The dog You're never getting another album from Rihanna. Why? She is worth. A billion dollars. Why would she? Why does she care? She doesn't need this little plebeian album sales. Like what? No, she does not need us. She does not. <laughs> we are not. We are not here. She does not care. She's like, I'm just gonna sell panties, draw, <laughs> you know, give y'all a little light beat. For Doesn't them. she have purses and? I don't know about that. A line. She had a line. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, she had a fashion line with Louis Vuitton. No, 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 no. So Louis Vuitton owns Louis Vuitton. What Hennessy owns? No, she came out with a purse. No, she didn't. Yes. The dog got a purse. Yes. I ain't seen that. Yes, she has a purse line. A purse line. Yes. Now I heard she was supposed to be coming out with couches or something. Oh. The doll is everywhere. The doll is purse and couches. I want. I want a Rihanna couch. A Rihanna (laughs) chaise lounge. If my couch don't come with Rihanna sitting next to me and we having a little cute kiki, I don't want my Rihanna couch. I want I want a Rihanna couch and I want to put a Rihanna book on my Rihanna coffee table. Like I just want a Rihanna house. Okay. Honestly, I'm going to give her all of my little coins because I stand. <laughs> I stand. Honestly, she's amazing. I love her. She has taken her career and just skyrocketed, and I just I I. She's amazing. Her titties are always out, and she's just always. always, always with the blunt in her hand. And I just, I can't help At but stand. You know, she's unapologetic. Unapologetic. Unapologetically black. She is. And and this is the thing. Rihanna is not even from America. No, but she's she from rides. Barbados. Well, she rides. And she rides for black people. I mean, she's black. But yeah. I'm just saying that in Barbados, America, they don't, yeah. they don't experience the type of racism. That you do in America because their country is a black country, you know, like they, they're black people. So, like, for her to ride so hard, it's she's I stand. I love school. it. I'm glad I've been down since Pondy Replay, and ooh, which we ain't gonna talk about how long ago that was. Oh, Rihanna has been giving hits. Well, Rihanna was oh, giving hits. She was giving <laughs> for a hits. very long time. I thought that was going somewhere else. No. I'm glad. No. I, my mind. My mind is bad. I'm sorry. She has been giving us the chart toppers for a very long time. And, you know, just accept it, guys. She's not giving us any more music. She's not. She's rich. She's joined Jay-Z in the Billionaires Club. Woo! And I just, I love to see it. Like, she's rich. Jay-Z. He sold some of his company. I, now, I wonder, I would. And they didn't release how much it's worth. No. So they didn't they didn't release the details. He never even released how much he bought the company for. For? Oh wow. Originally. So See. we'll probably also never get that. Forbes in um, seven years will just be like, oh, he's worth three billion now. Blue Ivy's probably worth, you know, half a billion already. Correct. Oh, yeah. I stand. Well she she absolutely is. But here's the thing. So Amon Dan Brignac. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is Ace. That's the real name. I was like, yeah. oh, I was thinking of the strip club. So, <laughs> so Ace of Spades, which is originally named Armand Dan Brignac, um, is going to be the featured champagne for the last episode of this season because that is going to be my birthday and we are going to pop bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so um when I you know started doing my little research and I found out about him I already knew he was the owner of Ace's Ace's Space, right? Yeah. But when I started like learning about the history of what he did with it, it, it was really a chess move when he mm-hmm. bought that company. 
That's how that's how you gotta do it, honestly. And then when it can be something that people don't know how much you pay for it. Isn't it crazy? Woo! That's that's a boss move because for the most part, stuff like that is public. Public, yeah. You know? So anyway, and now that he has sold half of the company, I don't know how I feel about it though. So I'm thinking he must have been, he must have stayed on as like you know, some, like he has to have control because you he wouldn't sell fifty percent. Like yeah. he would sell forty nine, right? So that way he's still majority holder. So I don't know how that worked because they're not going to tell us because they don't tell us anything because they're rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't know how I feel about it because one, and maybe I'm just being selfish. We feature black owned well, champagne, yes. and so now you have given a part of your company to this white owned uh, establishment, agency, but whatever, he's but, rich, and I am all for black people becoming more rich than what they already are. So. I So I was reading into it a little bit, and he did it mainly because he wanted to bring it into a luxury market, mm -hmm. because once you're you're owned by Louis Vuitton and Hennessy, that, they have so many different retail partners and so many different areas that they can place this, this champagne in, and it's, that was a move. That yeah. was a move and I stand, honestly. I just would like. That was really like dollar. checkmate. Initially he did a chess move and that was like checkmate. Right. Can but shout out to his wife because mm -hmm. she kills it every time. Uh, Icy Park came out this month. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking about Blue Ivy's. Net worth and the twins' net worth. I was ready. They continue to build, and I love every second of it. I had my credit card ready. I wasn't gonna do my debit card because I know myself, and I was gonna listen. I get. I put my credit card info in. I clicked. It said it was there, and then it said it was gone. And I said, okay, at least give me a bucket hat, Jesus. <laughs> I don't even wear a bucket hat. I can't do it. I got a big head. It don't look right. I don't like it. I tried to get me a bucket hat, thing was sold out. So I couldn't get nothing. And I'm upset about it because now I gotta pay these resale prices that's gonna be 300%. And Stupid. I just I just want a piece, like why I form literally changed my lunch break for work around trying to get this stuff. I was so, right there. I hate to say this to you. But Did you get the third? Yes. I did. Cut the camera. This is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, this is the third time I have been fortunate enough because I got the now the first drip, the first you know I did not get any of that. Yeah, I don't know anybody that did. I wasn't. I didn't even know that it was gonna be that serious. So I kind of got on the website like two hours later, like, oh, let me try to, baby, please. Okay, right. but that second time I was very much ready. So what was that during like the summertime or something like that? Yeah, like, yeah she's done like. Four drops, I think. And then she did the black Ooh, drop. The black. And I got the black. Uh, and then it's icy. Let me tell you though, what happened? Put the stuff in, boom, click. I mean, I was like on it. Baby, it circled for about 25 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that means I'm not gonna get no <laughs> <That's stuff." it. laughs> Baby, it finally stopped circling and I got everything I put in that little cart. Which, can you please stay off our necks? Because my bank account needs to relax, okay? I but didn't get a sock. You didn't get a, you I didn't couldn't even get a sock. <sighs> the kids, they, so the early, the pre-sale that came out like four hours earlier sold out, I think they said it's 36 seconds. Yeah. That is disgusting. Yeah. Beyonce is mean. Like, <laughs> she is rude. Because why would you even, you know how popular you are. Buy some more product, sis. Please do something. I mean, and I was excited because it comes in these big old sizes, and then I was just like, oh, this is it's gender neutral. <laughs> it is. And then she had Gucci Man on the, I was just. <sighs> Let me tell you, there is a, um, a, a very like popular Twitter personality. His name is It's Carrie. Oh, I stand. He so commented on her page Every like today, time. she or yesterday, something like that. She was posting after the drop, 
you know, different looks. And he was like, it's sold out, babe. It's sold out, babe. <laughs> and then she posted again, and he was like, sis, I tried to tell you it was sold out. And she posted again, and he was like, if you post one more time on this stuff that's sold out, none of us can get any of this. It's been gone. You know it's been gone. As you were eating your <laughs> probably organic strawberries from the garden that you have, you know, in the back that Julius probably picks everything for you for, <laughs> it's gone, honey. It's gone. It's very much so gone. Uh, well, she does an amazing job. Um, Cause that stuff make your body, woo, baby. I'm. T- it fits. It it fits and forms it, the body. She looked amazing. She looked fantastic, and I just really wanted to be a part of it this time. And I just, you know, God had other plans. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. She. Looks, I fine. guarantee you, she's coming down with some more. She will. Yeah. She, until then, I'm just gonna go to Rainbow and get another pair of twenty two ninety nine jeans. <laughs> Not Rainbow. <laughs> but do Rainbow even exist anymore? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. See you next month.